Alors, euh, bonsoir tout le monde. Bienvenue à l'Agence spatiale canadienne. Mon nom, c'est Sylvain Laporte. Je suis président de, président de l'Agence. C'est un honneur pour nous de vous recevoir ici euh, ce soir. Euh, ce soir qui est la, la fin d'une mission vraiment grandiose, la mission de, de notre, collègue, euh, notre collègue David. Euh, je voudrais aussi... Euh, 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 souhaiter la bienvenue à nos gens qui euh, sont sur les réseaux euh, sociaux, qui nous observent aussi euh, ce soir. Fait que bienvenue à vous aussi, puis euh, vous allez être témoin d'une très, très belle activité ce soir. On est tous fiers de David, on est tous fiers de ce qu'il a accompli euh, pendant le, le cours de, de sa mission, mais on a aussi hâte de le revoir entre nous et puis d'être capable d'y serrer la main, puis de lui demander de nous raconter un peu comment était son, son périple dans l'espace. Le, dans I still remember um, David's departure on the 3rd of, uh, of December last year in Baikonur. It was very, very, very cold. Um, so it's kind of appropriate to, uh, to see his return to us on uh, some of the hottest days in, uh, in the summer that we've had so far. So he's coming back into some really, really hot weather. So from really, really cold to really, really hot, it's, kind of, it, it's, a, it's a statement of how long he's been away from us. Um, I do also uh, remember very vividly something I will never forget for the rest of my life. Uh, I accompanied David from, uh, from the bus that dropped him off a few hundred feet from 100 meters from the, uh, the, the, the rocket. And I was able to accompany him all the way up to the ladder that led up to, uh, led up to the Soyuz. So um, being able to talk to David during those few seconds um, is a memorable event that I will never, ever forget. So without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, present to you uh, Bob, Kurt, Bob Thirsk and uh, uh, Jeremy Hansen, who are going to be the MCs for uh, tonight's uh, event. Fait que bonsoir à tous, et puis je vous souhaite un très bel événement. Uh, merci, Sylvain. Ça nous fait plaisir d'être ici avec les amis et les collègues uh, de David Saint-Jacques. Um, you know, I was here in December with uh, astronaut Jenny for the, uh, the launch of David to the International Space Station. So it's really nice to be back here again for the landing. C'est un jour aujourd'hui, un jour d'un grand moment pour tout le monde, la les amis de David, la famille, les collègues et tout le Canada. Bien sûr, et en fait, depuis le lancement de David le 3 décembre, il y a plus de six mois, l'expression pour David, c'était un grand succès. And uh, before we, we take part in watching these final moments of David's uh, expedition, let's uh, recap some things that happened earlier while you were all at home before you got here. So we'll have a short video for you. Bienvenue à bord de la Station spatiale. David Saint-Jacques, astronaute de l'Agence spatiale canadienne, est à bord de la Station spatiale internationale depuis six mois déjà. Le 1er mars, David a la chance d'assister à une première mondiale, le vol d'essai du vaisseau Dragon dédié au transport d'équipage. David est le premier astronaute à entrer dans la capsule qui était inhabitée, ou presque. Bon voyage, Dragon! Bon voyage, Ripley. Le 14 mars, trois nouveaux coéquipiers arrivent à la station. Les six astronautes travailleront ensemble jusqu'à la fin juin. Le 8 avril, David Saint-Jacques effectue sa première sortie dans l'espace. Bonjour, TC. Je suis prêt. Il est accompagné de l'astronaute de la NASA, Anne McLean. Durant six heures et demie, ils effectuent plusieurs tâches, dont le branchement de câbles pour fournir un circuit électrique redondant au Canada M2. David devient le quatrième astronaute de l'Agence spatiale canadienne à faire une sortie dans l'espace. On prend le temps de regarder autour et on prend le temps d'essayer d'absorber ça. Honnêtement, je suis sûr que ça va me prendre encore des semaines, des mois, peut-être des années à vraiment absorber l'expérience. 
Le 4 mai, David est aux commandes du Canada M2 pour attraper le vaisseau cargo Dragon de SpaceX. Bienvenue à bord, Dragon. Welcome on board, Dragon. À quelques semaines de son départ, David continue d'appuyer les opérations essentielles à bord de la Station spatiale internationale et savoure cette unique opportunité de vivre dans l'espace. C'est un immense privilège de se trouver ici. Très, très peu de gens ont eu la chance de voir ceci de leurs propres yeux. That's an incredible mission that David has uh, finished. Everything that uh, he's done, the robotics, the spacewalk, uh, the scientific work that he's done, uh, the public outreach work that he's done, with the support of his, of his team here, has been um, flawless. 204 days in space as of today. So if I was asked once today, I was asked 10 times, am I envious of David for breaking the record that I held as the longest uh, Canadian on the mission? <laughs> I, I had a 188-day uh, mission uh, 10 years ago. No, the answer is no. I'm proud of the work that, that you and David have done over the last uh, 204 days. Every time a Canadian astronaut flies in space, we need to do something extra. We need to break another frontier, the duration in space or the type of work uh, that we've done. So I'm very proud and very pleased that David has broken that record. Yeah, and a few statistics that kind of put this, this time frame in context for you. Um, Of course, David's been orbiting the planet once every 90 minutes. And so during his stay on board, he actually completed 3,264 uh, revolutions around our planet. And in fact, traveled just shy of 140 million kilometers. So pretty extraordinary. Uh, there's been many memorable moments, but I want to I frame a couple of really um, extraordinary moments uh, for you. And the first one being David having the opportunity to use Canada Arm 2 to capture a visiting vehicle. And what you need to understand is these, these vehicles have no one in them, and they fly up, and they're sort of flying in formation with the space station. And then the astronaut reaches out with a Canada Arm, and just before we grab it, we have to shut off all the thrusters of that vehicle. And then it's kind of like a rodeo from there. You don't know what you're going to get, and you have to go and grab that vehicle no matter what it decides to do. Maybe it'll start uh, moving outside its capture box, and you have to go after it. And so it's an operational moment. It's a high-pressure moment for an astronaut. And uh, David performed, of course, uh, extremely well and accomplished that for us. And then the next big moment, I know, uh, you know talking to David uh, both before he left and while he was up there, something he was really hoping to have the challenge to do was to go outside on a spacewalk. And, uh, and I remember watching uh, this day here from Mission Control, David going out on the, his first spacewalk and seeing that Canada flag uh, prominently displayed. This is the window to the airlock. So just before they go outside, we shove both the astronauts in the airlock, close this hatch, and then start venting or We actually capture that atmosphere back into the space station and then vent out the last little bit. But that's David and Anne in the airlock just before they open the hatch and go outside. And, uh, and this is something that I just think as an astronaut is a true privilege to go outside and see your planet, uh, your home planet, through nothing more than the glass on your helmet visor. And uh, David uh, has captured that in words, but he really um, thought that was an extraordinary opportunity for him. Uh, so, we're still uh, a few minutes away from bringing David back, so uh, now, actually I misspoke earlier, now we have a recap of the things that happened earlier today, so let's play that video right now. So, uh, earlier today, uh, David would be stowing the, the Soyuz vehicle with some of his personal belongings, some of the payloads, some of the biospecimens that they need to get back to Earth uh, quickly. He'll probably have stowed some of the future cargo vehicles that will return home with some of his personal belongings as well. And then they went inside their Soyuz vehicle. Uh, you notice someone's cleaning off the seal there right now. As uh, they get ready to uh, close the hatch, they have to make sure that those seals are spotlessly clean in order to get a, an airtight uh, closure. Uh, inside the Soyuz vehicle, they will bring their Sokol suits. They won't wear them as they go in, but they brought them inside with them. And once they've closed the hatch, they'll help each other don their Sokol suits, which are the pressure suits that would protect um, the astronauts during descent if there happened to be a depressurization. Uh, it's rather cramped space inside a Soyuz vehicle, so they rely on each other to help uh, don the, the Soyuz suit and then do a, a pressure check and then hook up to communication, hook up to ventilation, and hook up to oxygen uh, as well. 
And at uh, 4.10 uh, this afternoon, they, they said goodbye to their uh, three crewmates who will remain on board the station. So that's Nick, uh, Christina, and Alexei. And uh, they'll get ready for uh, descent. So this is a video of the uh, on-dock that happened earlier uh, tonight. So in just a moment here, we're going to see the Soyuz back away. This is what uh, David would have seen from inside the Soyuz, actually looking through a periscope at that docking um, target there that they used to actually dock when they arrived. And then this is, of course, their vehicle separating from the space station. There were latches on uh, the Soyuz side that were clawed over and ho hooked onto a, a berthing ring on the station. Uh, with the docking command, those latches move aside, and then the spring force in the docking mechanism pushes them slightly away at a few centimeters per second. Uh, once they get further no far enough away, 80 or 100 uh, meters away from the station, they'll fire the thrusters on their station to back them further away and, and put them into a slightly higher orbit uh, than the space station. So at uh, 9.55, a very critical thing happened, which is the deorbit berm. So they're basically flying just, uh, they, they open the distance maybe about 30 kilometers from space station, and then at 9.50 time, and that, that timing is precise, they fired their engines for about four minutes to start slowing the spacecraft down, which takes them from flying a circular orbit around the planet to actually changes it to an ellipse, so that now they're falling out of space slowly, so that they'll actually run into the Earth's atmosphere. And you have to get this right. If you come in too shallow, you'll skip off the atmosphere. And if you come in too steep, you'll burn up. And so it's a very critical burn uh, that had to happen, and it, it went off like clockwork. And just to give you a perspective, they're traveling 28,000 kilometers an hour when they were with station. That burn only slows them down 500 kilometers an hour. And that's enough to get them heading home back towards uh, Earth. And then that leads to uh, uh, spacecraft okay. separation. A few minutes after doing that deorbit burn, um, they'll fire pyros, pyrotechnic uh, devices, bolts on the, the vehicle, uh, which will separate the vehicle into three components. Um, the descent module is the middle component, is where David uh, and the other two astronauts and cosmonauts are, are located. Um, the descent module has got thermal covering on it, thermal protection to help it endure the re-entry heat that it's going to experience over the next few minutes. The other two sections, the propulsion section and the habitation module, do not have that thermal protection. So if they're looking out the window, they'll probably see them starting to tumble in the distance there, and they'll burn up in the atmosphere uh, while the descent module makes its uh, safe trajectory through the, um, through the atmosphere on, on the way down. Uh, at entry interface, uh, entry interface is a term that we call when the spacecraft reaches the top topmost aspects of the, um, of the atmosphere. And I can remember that because um, I saw little dust particles floating in the Soyuz module when we hit entry interface. And all of a sudden, for the first time in six months, dust particles started to trend downward ever so slightly. And then over the next few minutes, uh, the G-force begin to come on. You can see the G counter tick up 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, all the way up to 3.8, 3.9, 4 Gs. And then it began to feel this crushing weight on my chest as though uh, it was four people were sitting on my chest. And you actually have to think about getting enough air into your lungs to expand your rib cage and <sighs> to get enough air. And then to maintain blood pressure to my, to my brain, I had to contract the muscles in my thighs and contract the muscles in my pelvis and my, in my abdomen to collapse the underlying blood. I really needed it. And that's the phase they're in right now as we're talking. They're in that fireball right now. We expect them to come out of that fireball in uh, less than a minute. And uh, so right now we have no communication with the capsule. And then from now uh, to about 22 or 1033, we'll be looking for the parachutes to open then. So Bob, maybe tell us a little bit about what that feels like. So the entire descent is a wild and crazy ride. But the, the peak moment is when the, the parachute opens up. It'll open up in two minutes uh, from now. First of all, a, a drogue chute comes out of the top of the, of the descent module, and you hear this whooshing of, of wind. And then, all of a sudden, it feels like the spaceship is on a long, 100-meter-long bungee cord, just bouncing back and forth underneath the, the parachute. I don't know if that's actually what was happening or not. It could have just been my vestibular apparatus, which was out of practice. 
after six months of, of life and weightlessness, but it was really provocative. I felt a little bit motion sick, and I really was wondering whether or not this was normal. And I looked over to see my friend Frank DeWinna, who smiled. He had done this before, and he had this big, goofy grin on his face. <laughs> And Roman was uh, yipping and, and yodeling like a cowboy. <laughs> and they both gave me some thumbs up sign that this was all, all normal. So um, the drogue chute causes all this yo-yoing underneath the uh, parachute shroud. And then about a minute, half a minute later, the drogue chute drags out the main chute, which is a huge uh, 1,000 um, meter square parachute, which slows our descent rate uh, from oh, about 88 meters per second down to about seven meters per second, so a more gentle. Uh, descent through the, um, through the atmosphere. But that yo-yoing starts all over again. It takes about 30 seconds for it to, to die out, but um, that was one of the way that the vehicle was saying, welcome back to Earth, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but one minute to uh, main parachute deploy. So Bob, you were telling me earlier about how the, they uh, depressurize the capsule, what that's like. Yeah, after the parachute will be um, deployed, um, we'll have to jettison the heat shield, which is on the bottom part of the, of the vehicle. Uh, the heat shield has got the, the crew safely through the, the, the hottest and thickest part of the atmosphere, but it needs to be uh, jettisoned so that some antennas on the bottom side of the um, capsule can be deployed and also so that the landing jets can be exposed and ready for use as, as well. Um, the cabin pressure is a little bit too high, the internal cabin pressure where the crew members are sitting, so it also has an oxygen content that's a little bit too rich. So after the main chute has come out, and it'll be coming out in the next 10 seconds, um, we blow a valve which depressurizes the, the, the capsule almost to vacuum. And when that happens, again another loud bang, our pressure suits in, inflate, and then the inside of the cabin, it's all of a sudden filled with this instant mist. All of the water vapor inside the, um, the cabin uh, becomes condensed. And for about 30 minutes, 30 seconds, you're just brushing the mist away so you can see your control panel again. Again, it's a wild ride. And for a rookie like it was for me, like it is for David today, uh, it, it's very unexpected, and, 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 but cool. Yeah, the chute should be open now, listening for a report. So I'm just listening to NASA TV here. They've made contact with the crew now. So they've come through the plasma. They've got com good communication with the uh, search and rescue forces, saying they experienced 4.8 Gs on the reentry, which is nominal. So we expect them to be hitting uh, the nominal landing site. And you should know that there's a delay in our feed when I'm listening to this. So we're a minute or two behind. So the times won't add up exactly to what Bob and I have been talking about. So for the most part, it'll be the computer, the Soyuz computer that will guide uh, the reentry uh, trajectory for the Soyuz vehicle. But if there's a problem and the crew is ready to take over, a good landing is considered if you can land within All a right. 10 kilometer there it is. cone. And with no more than a, yes. than a 4G acceleration. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but every time I watch my friends come back to space, this is what I'm waiting for, is to see that big parachute, so. You can see a little bit of the venting, the capsule <laughs> there right now as well. Yeah, that's normal. We see that every time. Beautiful day there, we're getting a great view of this. So, so now this we've got, what, just over a 10 minute ride uh, down to the surface of the planet. About uh, 11 kilometers uh, above, the, above Kazakhstan, which is where they're gonna land, and about 10 minutes, like Jeremy says, to um, get down there. The other thing that has to happen is that uh, the landing is going to be um, quite an impact. So there's some shock absorbers in the back of each of the three seats. And the shock absorber is comp compressed right now. In order to be functional, it needs to be extended. So in unison, the three seats are all going to move forward uh, and uh, so that the shock absorber is ready to be activated for the landing. Now, I always thought that the Soyuz capsule was a small capsule. The control panel is right here and two other people are right here. After the, the seats are, are moved forward, the control panel is right here. <laughs> it's ridiculously cramped. <laughs> so what do you remember this part? You're talking to your crew, I assume, during this part. Did you, you, you were you celebrating or? 
uh, this is where we're, we're yelling and screaming. Like, we're, <laughs> we're not going to have big, goofy grins on our faces until we're actually on the ground. But main parachute deploy, that's a major milestone. And 99% of the risk is, is gone now. So this is going to be a, a, a good landing. Uh, we're talking, we're uh, finally picking up um, mission control again and picking up the search and rescue crew in our earpieces after the, um, the radio blackout. And the search and rescue crew are calling out to us our altitude, so they're saying 900 meters, 800 meters, 700 meters. Oleg Kononenko, who is uh, I think a three-time spaceflight veteran. That sounds right. Um, will be reminding uh, David and, and Anne to tighten up their seat harness. They are wearing a five-point seat harness to make it nice and tight, getting ready for the landing. To move their head back in the, um, in the helmet and then make sure that the tongue is away from, um, from the teeth as well. When they impact the ground, um, it'll be a bit of a car crash. And um, the seat liner, the shock absorber, the soft landing engines that will fire just before landing will all soften the landing, but it'll still be a, an abrupt hit with the ground. Yeah, I've always thought those things were, were not properly named, the, thr the soft <laughs> landing thrusters. Yeah. They're really just explosives on the bottom of the capsule that explode, and they explode two meters above the ground, and they just start the deceleration. So they just start the crash happening early is basically the way I look at it. So at this point, were you, uh, visors open at this point? Uh, no, visors are closed until uh, till we land. Um, there'll be several helicopters in the in the area uh, with the search and rescue crew, but also with the officials from um, Russia, NASA, Canada, uh, waiting to greet um, David. So who from Canada will be there? Rafi will likely be there. Yeah, I think Rafi and Ed is over there as well, Ed Tabra. So we've, we've got representation there for sure. That, uh, if you guys are paying attention, you're hearing a Morse code beep. Uh, th there it is right there. Uh, this is a search and rescue signal. So had the capsule not landed where we were hoping it was gonna land, this is a signal that we can use to help find the capsule uh, sooner. And so during that whole plasma portion we were talking about, we don't really know what's happening with the capsule. Uh, we don't know if it stayed in its primary entry mode or if they had to revert to a backup mode. So by the time that plasma ride is over, they may be way off course and we won't know it. And uh, we'll be waiting for this signal uh, to start figuring out where they really are. So in this case, they, it all happened like it was supposed to. So they're gonna land where we thought. And that's why we can see it in the camera. But in other scenarios, there are a couple backup modes. One backup mode where the crew flies it manually. And when I say fly it, you gotta kinda think about it like a wing. So the capsule, you think it would just fall like a rock, but it actually, if by turning it, you can change how it reacts with the air, kinda like an aircraft wing. So you can pitch it up or you can pitch it down. And you can change whether you go long or you go short. Uh, and in the backup mode, the cosmonaut sitting in the center seat could try to mimic the intended flight path and try to hit manually the original targeted area. And then the final backup mode is one called ballistic where you just spin the capsule just continuously and nullify any effects of flying. And what happens is it digs in really steep. You come in really fast and with a lot of G. So David uh, experienced 4.8 G, but on a ballistic uh, landing, you'd be experiencing over 9 G. And uh, what do you think that would feel like? Do you, th you remain conscious through all that? Uh, you'd be at your limit. If it was sustained, you'd be at your limit, I think, yeah. yeah. Just because you can't get the air into your lungs? Yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. One other thing to look for here, may be a little bit difficult to see in this video view, but um, as the capsule descends under the parachute, it's not coming down straight. It's on a bit of a, a cant, a little bit like a 30 or 40 degree angle uh, down. And this is done deliberately. Uh, the vehicle has undergone extreme exterior heating during the descent, up to 1,650 degrees uh, Celsius outside temperature, hot enough to melt uh, steel. Um, and in the, in the, so the, the cant, sideways cant it helps to dissipate some of the, um, the heat. And in the next few minutes, uh, there will be something called a rehooking of the capsule. So the capsule will straighten up and come down with the, um, the bottom of the, of the capsule uh, parallel to the, uh, to the ground, and that's so that the soft 
uh, landing um, engines, rockets, can uh, help to cushion the, the blow when, when it impacts the, um, the Earth. So that's another event. And again, it, again, it kicks off this yo-yo uh, bungee cord uh, adventure that I talked about a little bit earlier. So how do you folks feel? Were you a little nervous? A little bit? Who here is a little bit nervous? I was a little bit nervous. I, for one, am, uh, am glad to be at this stage of the landing. So this is great news. There's actually um, there's other, one other backup system that's very important that obviously we didn't need tonight. But there is a second parachute, the same size as this one. And so in the event that the first parachute doesn't fire or somehow is damaged, you can either cut it away or just fire the second one. And, uh, and so it's a very robust system, this Soyuz capsule. And uh, I've had really great success with, uh, with Soyuz landings. Speaking of parachutes, there's one more thing you can look for uh, at landing. Um, the capsule is um, being suspended by two main risers, two main uh, ropes that are coming down from um, the parachute. And at the moment of impact, the commander, Oleg, will throw a switch that will cut one of those risers. And the effect, we hope, is that it will deflate the, uh, the parachute immediately. If it's not deflated, the parachute can uh, be blown to one side by the wind and drag the capsule with it, drag it sideways across, uh, across the steppe, across the, uh, the prairie of Kazakhstan. So you don't want that to happen. So if Oleg can throw that toggle switch uh, quick enough, not, not too early, <laughs> um, perhaps the, um, the capsule can stay, um, stay upright. That would be nice. But, but it's not necessary. It's just a, a nice to have. Starting to be able to see the capsule now. It looks like the, the rear hooking has been complete. It looks like it's coming down uh, quite flush. Looks like we still have about uh, four minutes to go before landing. So do, you, do crews typically feel the effects, you know, some of the kind of motion sickness sort of effects at this stage, or how does that yeah, Factor so for people. during those parachute dynamics that we talked about a minute ago, yes, it's very provocative and you do have a, a sense of stomach awareness, if not uh, nausea. That will clear as soon as the dynamics uh, damp out. But um, I remember my first few hours back on, on Earth again when I stood up from the vehicle and I was moving around on my own. I really felt out of sorts and very provocative. So the first 12 hours, I wasn't too happy. Mm -hmm. And if you saw my image on video after my landing. I, I did my best to smile for Canada, but it was, <laughs> it was tough. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how David does today. But of course, that's not here nor there. That's not important. But um, the, the thing is that it will clear. The brain is a marvelously adaptive organ. And, and David will feel, uh, in spite of the potential nausea and a little bit of uh, dizziness, uh, he'll feel very fulfilled, proud, uh, proud of you and the support that uh, you've been able to give uh, to him in a very successful mission where he can come home and say that he's accomplished 100% of the Canadian and the uh, ISS um, objectives. So he's feeling pretty good right now. <laughs> I don't think we mentioned it yet. We were talking about it earlier about uh, fluid loading that we do. Yeah, so... You know, you lose about a half a liter blood volume during spaceflight, totally adaptive to the weightless environment. Um, but when you come back home under G-forces, that depleted blood volume can, dis can redistribute back into your uh, abdomen, into your legs again. You really need it up around your, your heart and your brain. So all crew members will ingest about a, a liter of, um, of um, a saline solution or a consomme solution to try to to help uh, rehydrate the cardiovascular system. And that's somewhat uh, helpful. The other thing is that underneath uh, the Sokol suit that we discussed earlier, the crew will wear this um, elastic type of um, garment, something like a G-suit that will uh, help to compress the veins in the, in the lower leg and help to distribute the, the needed blood flow up into the, what we call the central circulation. One of the search and rescue helicopters there, brief view. Mm -hmm. About a minute and a half to go. So there's a combination. Uh, people got out to the site via these helicopters or via land vehicles. So there's a combination of both. 
The helicopters are crucial if we don't land in the expected location because they can react immediately and take at least the, the, the quick response people to wherever the capsule happens to land. Uh, but in this case, we're going to have the full support on the ground for Davin and his crew. So we'll have both the helicopters and the ground support vehicles. And then at the end of tonight, when we, after we wrap up, uh, David will be on one of those helicopters uh, and heading to a nearby airport uh, to be returned uh, to Houston on a, uh, on a jet, on a NASA airplane that will fly um, both him and Anne. Uh, they'll make one fuel stop, but they're going to fly directly to Houston, and they'll be back in Houston in just about exactly 24 hours from now. So like I said before, our feed is slightly delayed, but we expect them to be touching down. Probably for us, I'd say in the next minute, one to two minutes, we should see a touchdown here. Uh, don't be alarmed at, if at the moment of, um, of landing you see a large flame that emanates from the bottom side of the, the capsule. That is the six um, soft landing jets. They, they look scary, um, but they're just... Um, ignited for maybe just a, a second or so. It probably burns some of the grass uh, around there, but it plays an important role in helping to cushion um, the impact with the, the ground. Very, very important. And I didn't notice it. Did anyone see the heat shield fall away? So the bottom of the capsule is covered by the heat shield that protects it on entry, but it, this gets jettisoned uh, quite, when they're still quite high in the sky, uh, gets jettisoned so that the soft, uh, firing engines can, uh, can work. Pretty monumental day for, uh, for David and his crew. Pretty special. Okay, landing coming up. Go. Whoa, <laughs> atterrissage. <laughs> All right, so now we expect high fives in the capsule. Yes. Assuming um, they're not being dragged across the step <laughs> right now. Uh, yeah. Something else you'll see, we'll see here shortly, but the capsule either lands upright, even if it doesn't get dragged, sometimes it gets tipped over on its side. And so it's kind of, you don't know what you're going to get. So worst case scenario, I think, I imagine, is to be hanging in the straps facing down. <laughs> So, you know, if Bob and I were in there together, we'd be shoulder to shoulder, and one of us would be on our side, one of us hanging down, and maybe one a little bit upright. How did you guys land, Bob? Uh, we landed upright. Um, so the good thing is that we didn't get dragged, but the bad thing is that the hatch to get out of the vehicle is up head, overhead, like, you know, a meter and a half away. <laughs> I looked up at that and I thought, there's no way I have enough the strength to get up there. <laughs> But on the other hand, uh, the situation that Jeremy describes, you know, it's kind of a precarious situation because if you release your seat harness, you're just going to fall, you know, so you don't want to do that either. So in some cases, it's, it's, it's totally fine just to wait for the search and rescue crew who will get to the capsule in 15 minutes or so to, um, to help you egress. Uh, the crew will be busy right now. They will, uh, if they land it upright, they'll be releasing their seat harness, opening their, their helmet deploying some antenna, depending on whether they landed upright or on, on their side, different antennae will, um, will be deployed and they'll open up some vents uh, as well. It'll be their first uh, smell of earth in six months. So I remember that. I remember smelling the, the grass of, uh, of Kazakhstan come through and, and I'd, I'd just forgotten what earth was like. You know, earth has a, a smell, it has a sound, you hear the wind. Uh, through the, um, the hull of the, of the vehicle, and you thought, man, I'm glad I'm an Earthling. I'm coming back to a, <laughs> such a beautiful planet. Nature is, uh, is one thing. Besides our family and friends, nature is another thing that we miss. Yeah, what is, you know, we, we have some time here. It's probably going to be a you know, half hour or better before we, we see David uh, out of the capsule, depending on how quickly the segment goes. So now we just have a chance to pick Bob's brain here a little bit about, <laughs> a little bit about uh, his space flight experience and maybe what we can expect to hear from David when he's back talking to us. But, you know, but tell us a little bit more about you know, your appreciation for Earth missing nature, well, you know, what's it like living in a tin can for six months and only smelling that one smell or maybe the smell of your buds after they work out? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, you know, living aboard a spacecraft like the International Space Station is not like staying at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Uh, if you're the kind of person who enjoys camping, then you'd be a great astronaut because, you know, as you know, we sleep in sleeping bags, we eat rehydratable food for most of the time. There's no bathtub, there's no shower, there's no washing machine, there's no dryer. So it really is a, a camping existence. But uh, we thrive on that. You know, we, um, you know, some days we will have uh, luxury hotels in, in space, but not in, in our lifetimes. It's a small, tiny um, cost to pay for work and, and flight in space. A lot of people ask me, you know, what do you miss most about space flight after 10 years? We just celebrated our, my crew's 10th uh, uh, year anniversary of our, um, of our expedition. Uh, I miss my um, opportunity to look out the window and look at this beautiful planet down below. I never had enough time at the window. I uh, wish I could have had more. Uh, I miss the science that uh, we did. All of the scientific experiments turned out well. I, I miss flying around like Superman. But I, I think the thing I, I miss the most is uh, my crewmates. Um, I remember maybe two and a half years prior to launch, the mission manager explained all of the objectives for our flight to us, and I didn't say anything. But I was thinking to myself, you know, fat chance that we can accomplish all of that. And after uh, the mission was over, we'd accomplish all of them. And we came home with more data and more experience than what people were, were hoping for. And um, I think it's important for Canada, for me, for all of us to pursue near impossible challenges all the time. Don't do what's expected of us. Do, do more than, than what you think is, is possible. Those are the kinds of challenges that people that work for space agencies do. And working with talented people, like the people in this room here, and my crewmates, uh, we, we were successful. And David has the, the same feeling as well. Uh, I talked to him by email a few days ago. And he described the six months as being surreal, mm -hmm. being magical, and uh, how his work efficiency was still increasing. He had, you know, in one respect, he was glad to be coming home today to see his family. Uh, the other respect, he was um, a little bit sad because um, he was finding that his ability to perform as an astronaut, it was still increasing, and he wanted to see what his limits were. So that was kind of an interesting perspective, and I identified with that. I, I knew what he was talking about. Yeah. I don't know if I ever told you, so when, when David and I, you knew this, but when David and I were selected, we, you know, we had the announcement uh, in Ottawa, and then not long after we went down to Florida to watch Julie's launch, you were already on board Space Station at the time, and, uh, and then uh, I missed Julie's launch because it, it got delayed so many times, I ended up going back the day after, or the day before she actually launched, but by the time I got back to Coal Lake, I walked out that night in the night sky, and ISS was going over, and uh, I could see like the two dots going through the sky because yeah. the shuttle hadn't docked yet. And so I saw you go by, I saw Julie trailing, catching up the space station, getting ready to dock. And uh, yeah, it's a special memory for me because uh, I was very excited to be uh, joining this adventure and joining your core and then to see the two of you, two Canadian stars streaming through the sky was uh, meant a lot to me to see that, pretty neat. You know, there's something about the, you know, the space program, you know, it, it brings people together. I've been re kind of retired now from um, active astronaut status for seven or eight years now. Um, but I'm never going to leave the space program. There's something magical about it. And I, I want to be involved to support missions like David's mission, your mission, um, and um, you know, the exploration of deep space. It's something that uh, is part of my DNA. And, and everyone in this room, I think, can say the same thing as, um, as well. It's, um, it's great when we can support missions in, in space. Let's do it more often. Yeah. yeah. And, and Bob's. Uh, not telling you the full truth, he's uh, very, very active in supporting uh, the space program today. He, uh, he's always gone out of his way to mentor the rookies, but uh, more than that, he's uh, working behind the scenes, working with any team, working on some medical stuff with us right now, but really helping uh, bring, continue to bring his extraordinary expertise and experience to the space program to keep pushing Canada further and further ahead. And you know, for a core of rookie astronauts, it's really important for us to have these mentors that we can talk to. So I know I've thanked you before, but I just wanted to say in front of all these people, we really do appreciate it that you just didn't disappear into the night on us and that we can still lean on you today and send you an email or call you up and, and you actually answer. So that uh, means a lot.
I, I wanted to ask you, Bob, when you were talking about, you know, David's efficiency increasing and, you, you know, you could relate to that. But just, you know, what does that really mean? I mean, to me, I've seen, I watch the crews from Mission Control. I see them early on. I see them at the end of their expedition. I mean, I see them, just the way they move is probably one of the biggest things that I notice. But maybe talk to us about that and uh, some uh, of the other efficiencies. Yeah, there's a couple things. So movement is the first thing is uh, after the first week, you, you learn that your legs are like useless appendages in space. You, they just sort of float in the breeze behind you as you move around. You tend to use your upper body grabbing handrails and, and corners of, uh, of racks as you, um, as you move, move around. It's much more efficient to move Superman style in space than to try to maintain a quasi upright uh, posture with your head towards the, the ceiling and your feet towards the, uh, the floor. It was always interesting whenever a shuttle came up to visit us because the station crew would be flying around like Spider-Man or Superman and the shuttle crew would always be walking around, you know, with their feet <laughs> on, on the ground. So you and I have a friend, uh, Dave Wolf, and he made an effort to try to adapt to weightlessness. So one day I was working out on the stationary bike, and Dave comes by. And Hang he's on, got show, his... show us that again. How are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Dave comes by with his feet on the ceiling and his, his hands on, on the floor. And so I applaud him and said, way to go, Dave. And he was heading off in this direction. And then about 30 seconds later, he comes back. And I said, Dave, what's the matter? And he said, well, I was heading for the shuttle, but I ended up in Soyuz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, working efficiency, though. So I can remember my first week on, on orbit. You know, I'd look at the OSTPV, which is the, the timeline that we work by. And I'd go and um, I was going to work at a workstation and, and repair something. So I'd go to the, the tool chest. And half of the tools that I needed were, were missing. Other crewmates had, had used them. And, so I'd get uh, lost, I'd sort of be stuck. I didn't know what to do because I didn't have the tools that I needed for the, for the task. But with experience, you know where you can find other tools uh, elsewhere in the station, or you can jerry-rig something that can function as a wrench or, or, or a pair of pliers. Um, I can remember another time that I was getting behind the timeline and I went to my workstation and there was a Ziploc bag there with all of the tools that um, I needed for my task. And how did that happen? Well, obviously, uh, one of my crewmates had, saw, had noticed that I was behind the timeline that day and had looked out for me and uh, put together all the tools that I would need so I could save 15 minutes uh, in my task. So teamwork is another uh, way that you can, um, you can save time and become efficiency and efficient in space. And then another thing that we would do is we'd take a lot of photographs during the day, and we'd have very high-resolution cameras. The image files were you know, 10, 14 megs each. And in the middle of the day, I'd go and download um, the photos to you, to the CSA. And that would clobber my laptop, you know, downloading these 14 meg files, you know, 200 of them. And I couldn't use my laptop for the, for the next three hours. So I began to realize, hey, when you go for dinner, why don't you, that's, that's the time to download um, the image files. So little tricks like that that you, um, you learn. And, and um, that's, those are just silly examples of hundreds of little tips and hints that make you efficient as a crew member. Yeah. yeah, I've been making you do most of the talking, so I yeah. thought I'd bring you your water. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, so David has uh, launched. We haven't uh, landed. We haven't seen him yet. Uh, but what's in store for him now over the next two or three or four months? Yeah. So, uh, like I said, uh, within about 24 hours, he'll be in, in Houston. And that plane is kitted out so that they have uh, two beds in there uh, for Anne and David so that they can, you know, they can try and get some rest. They've had a long day. When you think about it, I mean, you remember we said that the hatch closing was at four. So, you know, that portion of their day, I mean, that, they didn't wake up at four. They started uh, well before that. And that portion that they're in this capsule is about an eight hour trip for them. So imagine being on an eight hour plane ride, um, but except you're in an uncomfortable uh, space suit strapped into a seat and you have the whole stress of actually doing something and, and making sure your landing goes well. So it's been a long, a long, long day for them. It's not over yet, and they, they won't rest until they're on that airplane. So hopefully they'll be able to sleep. And then when he arrives in Houston, um, uh, his wife, uh, Veronique, and the kids will be there. Uh, a few others from the astronaut corps will be there. It's a private, it's a private event. They'll just get off the airplane. They'll say hello uh, to their family. They'll high five the rest of the folks that are there. And then he'll leave with, uh, with his family and go back to what we call crew quarters which is, uh, it's our quarantine facility. He's not, he's not gonna be in quarantine, but that is our quarantine facility prior to shuttle launches. And as we ramp up to flying out of the United States again, we'll be using it for quarantine again. So he'll go back there. He'll sleep there uh, tomorrow night. He won't get to go to bed right away because uh, 
well, the same thing's gonna happen to them here. When we pull them out of the capsule, it's gonna be all smiles and high fives, but then they're gonna pull them in a tent and then the doctors are gonna start, <laughs> start their business. And there'll be uh, needles and testing. And, and then when they get to Houston, there'll be more needles and testing. And then uh, every day after that will be more needles and testing and MRIs and all sorts of fun stuff for David to do. Um, but he'll, every day he'll have more and more time to spend with his family, uh, certainly in the evenings. And then uh, he's got to start rehabilitation. So I mean, he'll be, we'll see uh, that he'll be walking. He'll walk off the airplane tomorrow, but somebody will be holding his arm because you, know, you, you just don't have the vestibular uh, stability to, uh, to trust yourself or for the doctors to trust you to do that. Um, and so the, he'll be being helped, but he'll be walking, but he'll have to start, he'll be getting in the gym, he'll be working on his coordination and continuing his strength exercises. He'll be working with our trainer uh, down in Houston on that. And then, uh, then we got debriefs. They're gonna wanna debrief the crew. To, we gotta pull as much information out of their brains as we can while all these medical tests are going on. Um, at some point this summer, we're actually gonna give him some time with his family for vacation. I think he's earned it. Uh, so he'll get a little bit of time. And then, uh, you know, something that's really important to us at Kane Space Agency is we want to, I mean, we're, we feel like we're sitting on a treasure chest of uh, space exploration. We want to share it with Canadians. And so uh, David will be uh, traveling around Canada and sharing his experiences uh, with Canadians. So, of course, uh, now this white thing that you see, these ladders, they didn't come down with the capsule. They've been be constructed the at the capsule. Uh, the Obviously, David's uh, ended up landing upright, just like Bob's Randy landing did. NASA Down in the bottom here, you see one of the windows. There's two windows the in the Soyuz capsule. So David is beside one of those windows on the outside. At the very least, it looks like you guys got a beautiful day. And uh, what we can expect next is once they get the hatch yeah, open, they're going to climb down in there, there and they're going to pull the commander out first, the Russian commander, because he's sitting in the middle seat. He's kind of in the way of getting to the other and, two. Uh, the crews have here on the ground really quickly. Everybody's gathered up around the capsule now, just waiting for them to, to begin getting the crew members out there. Um, that should be happening momentarily. Um, and it sounds like y'all have video, so you'll be able to see it real time. Yeah, Brandy, we just started getting some first views. Kind of walk us through what's what's going to be next for the crew on the ground there. What are people going to see over the next couple of minutes once we start seeing him come out of the capsule? He's obviously on site talking to us. Yeah, they'll um, get the crew members out of the capsule one at a time and move them over to the chairs in front of the capsule, like you're used to seeing. Um, after that, as soon as they've kind of given everybody a minute to to uh, do, some, do some quick tests, they'll move out to the medical kit, which is already set up and waiting for them. Um, over there, they'll be doing a number of tests as well, including the field test, seeing how they are able to, to complete uh, normal everyday tasks after coming back from a six-month stay in space. And also a robotics test to see how they're able to handle uh, something like the Canada arm um, following a, 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 a touchdown. And we are... Starting to see the crew members take them out uh, right now. You may have a better view than me, but it looks like it's Oleg Konenko first, which is usually the case for the commander. So now he gets to go down the slide. Yep, it looks like Oleg's first down, and he's going to make his way down this slide here. About how far is it, would you say, between here uh, and those chairs where they're going to get carried over to? I think I'm going to bring some. Oh, like <laughs> Seems 15 like feet, probably. Not far at all. It's mind-blowing to me, like we saw an image of Alex two hours ago floating in weightless. Well, Looking good to start with. I'm sure the second crew member will be, be uh, close behind. I'm not sure if that will be Anne or Dubi, but uh, they're already turning back to the capsule to start uh, pulling them out as well. All right, our video is starting to get a little ratty, so we definitely appreciate the updates as they're coming in, Brandy. We did lose that signal. Uh, just momentarily, we'll hopefully get that back shortly as we are getting that from a very remote place. And there it is. We got the views back. Uh, but And there it goes. Uh, but we do have one crew member out. Uh, Brandy, what's what's up for the crew uh, after they're through with the medical tent? Do you know where which city they're going to be going back to? They're going to be uh, going back to the airport at Karaganda um, to get on a uh, for Anne and Zadig get on a plane back to Houston. Uh, Oleg will go back to to Moscow. Um, they'll be doing some tests at the airport there as well. And of course, uh, once they're all seated in the in the chairs here, they'll be making some calls to their friends and family to let them know that they landed safe.
Come over here and bring the phone. Could you step away, please? And, Brandy, we're getting a view of a couple of uh, the NASA and Canadian team members there. Uh, for our viewers at home, you'll be able to count them out by, or single them out by the blue flight suits that they're wearing, uh, all of the different NASA landing team members wearing those um, to, uh, to, to kind of uh, pick them out of the crowd. As you can see, there's quite a f number of uh, landing forces there. Reading uh, biometric parameters. Come over here. Nikolai Fimich, Nikolai Fimich, we have the data. And here's Ian McLean waving to the crowd, uh, with just the crowd, uh, looking very excited to be back on Earth and getting a round of applause and response. And I think we have a few of Ann's friends and family here in Mission Control Houston hearing some cheers from our viewing gallery as uh, Astro Animal makes her way out of the capsule. Again, this was Anne's first space flight, 204 days in space. That's a heck of a heck of a duration for a first flight. She looks like she came through it well. She looks like she's feeling pretty good right now. Over here, uh, over here towards me. Uh, lift her higher. Looks good. Okay, go ahead and get the data. And Brandy, we're starting to see the NASA team kind of move in again for our viewers. Uh, some of the medical professionals, you can see uh, one on uh, the left of Anne, that's one of the flight nurses and uh, her flight surgeon, uh, Natasha Cho, uh, just in front of her. They're there just to help get some initial medical checks, see how the crew members hold it up as they're uh, responsible for helping support the crew health, uh, both before, during, and after their space flights. Yes, and astronaut Joe Cobb is also there standing by. Uh, he'll be getting a, for the, the friends and family that she'll be calling on the phone for and then just kind of acting as her uh, advocate as, as she moves through the post-flight phase and back to Houston. All right, well, it's great to see Ann McLean back on the ground, definitely uh, looking like she enjoyed the ride back home, again, wrapping up her first space flight. 
We're getting a, a shot now of the commander. Uh, this is also a chance for the crew members to uh, speak to some of their family members via sat phone uh, once they've reached back down here on the ground. So, Brandy, we're getting some good looks of the crew in the chairs. How does it look with uh, David St. Jacques, our Canadian astronaut, coming out shortly? Looks like they're getting close. Um, not quite pulling them out yet, but it uh, should, be, should be just the next few minutes. Okay, these are prime and these are backup. Really is a gorgeous day for landing, a little on the warm side, but there are literally butterflies flying all around the capital. Um, all the crew members out so far are looking good, like they're, they're feeling pretty good, enjoying being back on Earth, and it uh, looks like they're getting closer to getting, getting the beat out as well. Yeah, and definitely not looking the worst for wear. It's been quite a long day for these crew members as uh, they are up for several hours and then it's a pretty long time in those suits and in those chairs. Now in different chairs, but uh, back in Earth's gravity, uh, getting their first breath of fresh air in over 200 days. Some water. And here comes David, pulling him out now. Also getting a round of applause and giving a thumbs up to the crowd. Because they're helping him down now. That's all three members out of the uh, capsule and safely in their chairs. So I'm gathering around them here as they uh, sit through a few tests, make a few few calls, and then they'll be spirited off to the medical tent for those additional tests. All right, well, it's great to see all three crew members out on the field there, out of the capsule. Uh, Brandy, thanks for the updates, especially as we were waiting to get some of that video. Uh, what's up, what's up next for you uh, on the on the flight home? Are you going to be traveling back with these crew members, and uh, kind of what do they still have rest for the rest of their day? So they again will be going back via helicopter to the uh, airport in Karaganda, and uh, for uh, the San Jack and and McLean, they'll be getting on a NASA plane to make the flight back to Houston. Um, be More arriving needles. on right away. Keep <laughs> uh, you. Tuesday. Uh, and then um, uh, Oleg Klinikia will be making his way back to Moscow, and I will not be playing with him. I'll uh, be on the first class. Oh, here we go. We got an apple. <laughs> Nobody told Anne you have to accept the fruit. You know, it's a good sign that. Uh, a crew member is able to eat something, you know, that says that the nausea is under control. But the other thing, knowing Alec, he's keeping his, um, his neck uh, rigid. He's, if he has to look left and right, he's just moving his eyes. He's not moving his head. That, that helps uh, by keeping a rigid head. 
uh, with respect to his torso that helps uh, control the, the motion sickness problems. <laughs> he's showing off. That's right. He really wants to fly again, so he's <laughs> like, uh, I'm going to eat this apple. Yeah. <laughs> cargo vehicles but as brandy's been describing all the crews just kind of undergoing some initial medical checks you can see some of the sensors being applied by the different flight surgeons and nurses and then pretty shortly they're going to be uh, transported over to that medical tent and that'll be their chance to get out of these suits that they've been wearing for the last couple of hours well the vehicle has not failed well, us. jeremy uh, this is a soyuz landing in kazakhstan this is land landing uh, for the commercial vehicles coming up in uh, the next um, year or two, yeah. uh, will there be similar types of landings? Yeah, so uh, you know, right now we're well into the development stage on two new vehicles called Commercial Crew that are going to take uh, astronauts from the Cape again to the International Space Station. So one uh, vehicle is from SpaceX and the other vehicle is from Boeing. They're both going to fly. Um, in fact, SpaceX has already did, they did their test flight during David's stay there. There was nobody on board. Uh, we expect uh, in less than a year to be flying our first cruise on those two vehicles, the first crewed flight tests to space station. Um, I'm not sure, we're not sure how long those, those uh, test missions are going to be. But uh, when they come back right now, what's planned is SpaceX is actually going to land in the water. And uh, Boeing is going to land uh, on land, uh, basically in the deserts of the southern states. So uh, I think one of them is... Uh, in, uh, let's see, in Nevada, I guess, one of the landing sites. I'm not sure where they all are. But so it, that one will look a lot like this, where we'll target a point on the ground and we'll have rescue forces there. The other one will look a lot different. It'll be uh, rescue boats coming in to uh, extract the crew. And so we've done water entries before during the Apollo Gemini uh, missions. However, those were short duration missions. And so crews coming back from long duration, we're fully anticipating that the water entry uh, is, is going to be a little bit of a, a wild ride after you land and you're in those rolling seas and your capsule and you're, you're going to be very stimulated. So we're expecting a lot of barf bags, the bottom line, will be used on those ones. Um, but it's uh, just going to be part of it. And, uh, I'm not sure, you know, like it would be very different. I don't know what we're going to be able to see for video uh, out there and with this going on, so uh, time will tell. The Orion spacecraft, you may have heard of this one. Orion is going on top of the NASA heavy lift vehicle, and that one is built to go into deep space. So that's the one that's going to take us back to the moon, beyond the moon, and that capsule is also going to land in the water. So we've been, we've been doing a lot of preparation to get ready to do these water um, rescues after entry. So it'll be very, very different. But beggars can't be choosers, so uh, I'll take whatever one they offer me. Water or land doesn't really matter. And it's intuitive, of course. The longer the flight that you're on, the more deconditioned your body will be uh, after the mission is over for, for landing. There'll be more muscle wasting. There'll be more um, cardiovascular deconditioning, um, maybe more um, vestibular upset as, as well. So it'll, it'll be challenging especially after the extremely long missions uh, that we're planning for the next decade. Mm -hmm. So Bob, you've been uh, switching gears a little bit. You've been helping us with some of our, our medical endeavors. So I thought maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that because uh, you know, we've got a really bright future ahead of us with respect to space exploration, going out to the Lunar Gateway, um, and so just maybe your thoughts on medical, how we're going to tackle that problem here in Canada and the benefits. Well, the uh, opportunity to explore deep space is exciting to me, to, um, to you, to the Canadian Space Program. Medical operations for shuttle and for International Space Station astronauts is what we say is Earth-centric, which means that if there's a major medical problem aboard a space station, 
then it's the, the medical team on the ground that can help us through uh, you know, a serious uh, malady, a serious trauma, or a serious illness on board uh, the station. Uh, the philosophy is to stabilize and then to fly home. So the onboard crew would stabilize the injured crew member and then as quick as possible deorbit the, uh, the crew member uh, to Earth for definitive uh, treatment. And that type of Earth-centric model works great when you're close to Earth and you can get someone home in 12 hours or so. And when you have plenty of voice and data communication, that works great. But when we go to deep space, we're talking about incredible distances. From here to Mars is 400 million kilometers. And it means that if you are on Mars and speaking to me, saying good morning, it's going to take up to 20 minutes for me to hear you say good morning and another 20 minutes for you to hear my good morning back to you. Um, what happens if you call and say, um, uh, Jeremy has just been electrocuted, can you help us? Well, it's gonna take 20 minutes for me to hear you say that, and obviously I cannot help you. So the crews on the deep space missions must have more autonomy and more have te uh, telemedicine uh, care. So uh, we think that uh, with all of the, uh, the state of healthcare innovation in, in Canada, with their, the competence that we have in clinical training and in, in uh, medical education systems, uh, with our industry and the Toronto-Windsor uh, corridor there, the, the innovation and startup culture there, we think that uh, Canada can play a serious role in adopting some of these new modes of deep space uh, healthcare in autonomous medicine and in virtual care medicine as, as well. So I'm involved in, um, with a task force. We're looking at uh, whether or not uh, Canada can do this. Well, we already know the answer. Canada can do this. We do have the capability. We do have the will to do it. Now we're just trying to define who should be uh, involved under the leadership of the Canadian Space Agency that, so that Canada can uh, continue to contribute in um, not just the traditional ways to the exploration of, of space, but also in um, new ways as, as well, to expand our networks of, of partners and to expand our areas of, uh, of competence. So I'm hoping that some of the technologies, some of the models, some of the approaches, uh, some of the training that we develop for deep space astronauts can be spun off to uh, social benefit um, here on, on Earth. I think of the north of Canada. You know, I'm talking about you know, Nunavut, uh, the Yukon, the Northwest Territories. And that's a pretty harsh environment up there, not too dissimilar to what deep space is all about. You know, the environment is working against you. The temperature is working against you. The sparse population is working against you. The distance is working against you. And some of these technologies that potentially Canada can develop for the deep space exploration program can be spun off to aid uh, northerners. Um, the Canada Healthcare Act, a piece of legislation, federal legislation from 1982, says that all Canadians should have uh, reasonable access to laboratory and healthcare facilities in Canada, and all Canadians should have access to top quality healthcare. Well, if you live in Montreal, that's true. If you live in Resolute, or in Cambridge Bay, or in Pangerton, or in Inuvik, you do not have access to quality healthcare. And perhaps the Canadian Space Agency and our health innovation partners in Canada can help to um, uh, minimize the risk of long duration space flight, improve healthcare delivery for future astronauts, but also for Northern Canadians as well. That'd be very gratifying for me. Yeah, and uh, you know, medicine's not my area of expertise at all. But uh, this one really speaks to me, you know, this synergy of bringing our two teams together, people that are very passionate about healthcare in Canada, bringing our space team into that team, bringing the expertise of things we've learned about space and uh, bringing autonomy into it and all these things. I think it could bear a lot of fruit for Canadians. It's going to give, you know, very important to understand is, you know, we, we didn't actually pay money to send David to space, for example, or to go up there and do science. We created things here in Canada for the benefit of Canadians, and then we bartered them. We traded them with the United States, and that's what allows us to fly humans in space and to do science. And so these are the types, you need these ideas, you need these grand visions, and international partners have to look at your grand vision and say, yeah, we need that, we want that, and in exchange for that, we will, we will allow you to fly your astronauts on our vehicles, and we'll allow you to send science to space and to continue to evolve those studies and to learn more. And so having these types of things is a very important aspect, these ideas and pushing those boundaries. And I just have this gut feeling that Canada is really going to come out strong on this medical front and really do us proud. So I'm very excited to see that.
Yeah, thanks. Uh, the other thing that appeals to me is that it can broaden um, the Canadian Space Agency's partner network as well. Instead of the traditional partners uh, and industries that we've been working with for the last decades, there's potentially new partners out there. So from the government to the, from the federal and provincial um, health ministries, they can help us uh, out. Uh, the indigenous people would be part of this potential network. In fact, they'd be drivers uh, in uh, this potential uh, effort. And then a lot of the, um, the healthcare innovation uh, community who haven't been, they've been participants, but um, we want them to play more of a leadership role in this deep space healthcare if we, if we run with it. So there's an opportunity for Canada to broaden our area of influence in uh, space exploration, but to broaden our partnership network as well. I'm excited about yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I think they're in the medical tent. Um, we didn't see a, a lot of David. Obviously, he's probably not feeling 100%. Uh, and it's totally fine. Like I was, I've been trying to tell you for the last hour, I felt like I felt terrible uh, when I landed, and I just needed some alone time with my, with my flight surgeon. And it, like I said, it took me 12 hours or so, and by then I felt like I, I could move around on, on my own. Um, let me add one more thing that uh, Jeremy was talking about some of the activities that David will participate once he gets to the Johnson Space Center in, in Houston. Um, one of the tests that I did, and I think that David will need to do, to test for his balance and his orientation is, um, uh, is this equilibrium platform. So you step on this platform, and you're inside three quarters of a, what looks like a telephone booth, and you're looking at patterned, uh, 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 patterned walls all around you on three sides. And then the test conductor pulls the, the platform back, the platform that you're standing on backward and dis, you know, disturbs you. If, if you're fully adapted to, you know, to a 1G environment, you can, you can catch yourself. But if you're you know, more adapted to the weightless environment, you always fall over. So I hated that test. See, that's what I'm telling you, no surprise. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all that someone would come up with that idea. Yeah, so it's kind of more. Yeah, one more torture test for astronauts coming back from space. But, it, but after about 10 days or so, um, I was able to su successfully pass that test without falling down. And, and then my flight surgeon gave my, my car keys back to me, and he said, you could drive now. Okay, well, uh, you know, the other thing I thought would be worth mentioning to you folks who are, you know, obviously have an interest in space, but we announced earlier this spring that uh, Canada is committed to partnering with NASA. We expect our other international partners to follow, but we're, we're leaving low Earth orbit again. We're going back to the moon, and Canada committed to developing uh, the Lunar Gateway, which is kind of like a tiny space station out by the moon, but really it's a, it's a hub it's a place that you go to continue to do more research, to learn, but also like a reusable hub so that you can, if you have lunar landers, they can go back and forth from the moon to this hub, be refueled, reused again. Spacecraft can travel back and forth between Earth and this location. And, uh, and Canada has decided that we will provide the robotic systems for that. So it's Canada Arms, like Canada Arm 3, but it's much bigger than that. It's much more ambitious and bold. We are going to make create more autonomous robotics. We're gonna actually integrate artificial intelligence into this arm because we're going to need to at those distances from Earth. And these are the types of things that are gonna allow us to be part of international efforts to go back to the moon. And you may have heard recently that the US is very focused on getting humans back on the moon in 2024. And uh, to put this in perspective from the way I see it, all of this is very positive for us. Canada is very much committed to creating part of this reusable infrastructure that is gonna keep Canada a major player in space exploration just like we are today. And these are the kinds of things that enabled us to send David to space and will continue to allow us to do great things on behalf of Canada. So you should know that our future in space is looking very bright for Canada right now. We have tremendous opportunity ahead. And uh, you know, the last thing I'd like to say, and I'll leave a closing remarks to you, Bob, but. Um, you know, this, this is a victory for all Canadians, what we saw David do today. An astronaut doesn't get there on their own. The only reason you go to space is because of some of these things I've been alluding to, that you're part of a huge team, and Canada has been behind the Canadian Space Agency producing innovative technologies that are allowing us to partner and go do these bold things. And so, basically, I would say uh, you all deserve a pat on the back. It's Canada at large that enabled this uh, amazing thing that we witnessed today, the end of David's mission. <clears throat>
You know, um, I've been asked a few times what's the uh, best thing about the International Space Station. And, um, you know, it is a wonderful lab. You know, the partners got together back in the 1990s and, and uh, we decided that we wanted to build a space station where we can do research that just was not possible in, in space, uh, research that uh, removes the G vector, re research in a weightless environment. So plant biology, animal biology, human physiology, materials processing, fluid physics, combustion science, medical test uh, demonstrations. And uh, if you had asked me before I flew on my flight, um, I would have said the best thing about the station is that it's a, a world-class facility for doing this kind of research. If you ask me today, after I've, I've flown, I think the space station is a laboratory of no earthly peer, but I think that the best thing about the program is that it's international. It's brought together former Cold War enemies uh, into a, a partnership. Uh, the partners sometimes have political and ideological differences uh, amongst them. Our relationships with all of the political relationships with, with all the current partners right now is, is not really solid, but we all continue to work on, on the space program. And the reason for that is that we all have a common vision. Our vision is that we want to extend the capability of uh, human capability in space. We want to use the space program to push innovation in our respective countries. We want to use the space program to solve socioeconomic problems on, uh, on Earth. If, if we can put a, a Canadian aboard the International Space Station for 204 days, and we can address you know, the pension crisis and the national debt and, and Senate reform, we can do this because we can do, we can do that. And then maybe most importantly, um, uh, we're inspiring the next generation of, uh, of astronauts, of, of engineers, of scientists, of, of leaders um, by the, what we're doing in, in space today. There's something magical about uh, the space theme. There's something magical about the exploration of space that catches young people's attention and inspires them in their, in their STEM, in their STEAM uh, uh, experiences. When I was uh, a child, I was inspired by the the Apollo moon landing program. The Apollo astronauts were heroes of mine. And I absolutely was changed uh, by the space program and the way that my educational path went, my career path went. And I'm sure that the space program uh, had an influence on the direction that your yeah, educational absolutely. path and your yeah. career ended up uh, going as well. So David has been a, a great example. This is why uh, we need to continue to do this. And we need to do it in an international uh, setting. Um, you know, Jeremy, you mentioned some of the attributes that Canada brings to these kinds of partnerships. We do have great technology. We do have an innovative spirit in this country, but we also are great diplomats, mediators. We know what multicultural uh, skills are all about. We know what teamwork is all about. We know what followership and leadership uh, are all about as well. So even from the non-technical areas, I think that we have a, uh, a need, a, a means to contribute uh, forever for more. ISS flights uh, for Canadian astronauts in the future, but also let's, let's go to deep space as well. That's great. Well, folks, uh, Oleg, Ann, and David, our very own David St. Jacques, are safely back on the planet. Thanks for joining us tonight. Bob, thanks very much uh, for thanks, taking Jeremy. the time to be with us. Congratulations, everyone. Have a good evening.